possible for an independent movement, social or political, to thrive in 2024 and beyond against the face of our government, even if our government has a great deal of contempt for said movement's ideologies. It's a question that obviously makes you think, but immediately my mind just goes to yes. Uh, of course it can survive. And, and we've seen examples. Matter of fact, guys, we can go all the way back to the 1900s, okay, when the Socialist Party first started. Basically, 40 years, it grew into 113,000 members. Again, that's going against capitalism. That's going against everything. And the key thing is they had to spread, right? No technology back then. It was newspapers. 380 newspapers evolved from that. 353 towns. So the socialist movement did have a way to offset government. What about the NAACP? Uh, from 1909 to 1977, uh, it grew to 80 branches, okay? And over 300,000 members. Uh, and then the National Women's Party, which I love, it's because in 1913 to 1922, they actually changed the constitution to allow women to vote. So my answer to that is yes, you can uh, offset the government and have a movement, but it's not going to be easy. And I can just... Eddie, I'm with you. The fast answer is yes. Not a problem, not an issue. But uh, be careful. Be very careful. The, Avi, the one problem I have with this question is that the way you talk about the government, you assume that it is a thing. The government. But the government is... A mess. The government is a million different things. Uh, the government's very interesting. It's got no money except what they tax from us. And not only that, they could tax our children and grandchildren in the future. People who aren't even born, they could tax them. Uh, the government can. The government does. can support an idea. As, as Eddie said, an idea that's negative. If they want to get, if they want to create that kind of fire. I had, I'm very lucky in that I was at a very strange place at a very strange time. Uh, my aunt, Aunt Hermine, uh, she was a state senator of Texas and she wrote and passed the Equal Rights Amendment for the state of Texas. Now, let me tell you, Texas government did not want it. They fired shotguns at her house. Uh, they threatened her life. I think the newspaper called her the whore from San Antonio. Uh, she went through all sorts of hell, but she passed the Equal Rights Amendment for the state of Texas. And this was back in the 60s. I didn't even know this about her meme. Why is what I stand for, which is reminding people that we should never judge someone based on the surface Yes, NBA legend. Yes, a man who can play on the hardwood. But there's so many other layers we can peel back if we make the mm -hmm. effort to get to know others. You yeah. epitomize that, good sir. So, What I want to focus on is the word thrive. Can these independent movements thrive? Um, meaning, and the, the definition that I'm going to focus on is to grow, develop, and progress. What happens it's the same culture that began cancel culture. You, you know, where, where you get canceled. If, you, if the outlet is the internet, if, if somebody wants to get you, they can get you by cutting you up. By doing that, how, how do we protect ourselves against that kind of abuse of the system? Of being canceled when you really didn't do anything. If they know that there's a hot button issue of like, oh, Me Too movement or the, the racial issue, if they could just say, oh, someone's a racist, someone uh, touch me, you know, and it's not true. How, what remedies really do Really the have? only thing that I can say for that is just the fact of people are innocent until proven guilty. Listening to their stories and actually doing your own research. Please name a time in your life where you felt the need to let go of someone or something in order to achieve a particular goal. Going through like some tough times, just a lot of things going on in the home life. And she decided to, when we were talking, she let us know that she was going through 
um, a gender change. There was one friend who wasn't all for it, and it was mostly for religious reasons. The ultimate goal, the ultimate achievement of preserving the inner peace and inner sanctity of our friend group, I had to make the decision to cut this person off and cut ties with them from us. Empty theater got went up into the stand, uh, the, the audience and sat there and just prayed. And I was saying, please, is something going to happen in my life that I'm going to be able to have this dream of mine come true? And then I hear the door open and shut and I thought it was probably the security coming to throw me out. And instead, this girl comes and goes on stage and in the spotlight immediately acts like she's on a tightrope and begins to walk across the stage in the darkness. And as she walked, I fell in love with her. And I found out her name was Beth and she was from Mississippi. And I started pursuing her seriously. We ended up in a relationship for 16 years. And we get a phone call from Gilbert Parker, who happened to be the head of literary of William Morris Agency in New York. And he said, could I please talk to Beth Henley about her play, Crimes of Passion? And I, I put Beth on the phone and he said, I'd like to work with you on this play. Suddenly she was gone all the time and there wasn't a lot of time. And then there were violations of trust and our relationship, I got demoted kind of from being the sweetheart to being the yard boy. This is very good. Let's read the scene. I read the scene. By the time I got to my hotel room, the phone's ringing. I have the part in Mississippi Burning. Alan Parker in Mississippi Burning became my mentor. But more than that, I didn't know he had been through a bad, bad breakup. More than that, the casting director of Mississippi Burning was Howard Fuhrer, who was the casting director of Groundhog Day. And so because I left Beth and underwent all of that stuff, I ended up with Alan Parker as my friend doing Mississippi Burning and Groundhog Day. And then I ended up meeting a lovely girl named Ann. And Annie and I now have been married 35 years. The one person that was in my way was Mark Smith because I had to make a decision. Mark was a partier. Mark liked to dabble in drugs. And I'm not afraid to say that now because if you get to the end of the story, you're going to know why. So I was his roommate for three years and I held on. But let me tell you, holding on is like a movie, Stephen. I am telling you because we moved off campus our second year and we actually moved to a trailer park. Like He would never be able to convince me to do drugs. He would never be able to convince me to hang out all night. I wasn't worried about that. What I was worried about was that I needed to put all my energy into graduating and getting out of that school and having a great opportunity to make the MBA and not be a part of something that he could have brought back to that apartment, right? So as we left Illinois, I got my degree. I went on there drafting to the NBA. He didn't make the NBA, but he went over to Europe. And, and this is where it's tough for me because I look back at this and I say, Eddie, did you do the right thing? Because I could have carried both of us. I could have. <laughs> but that decision I made, I thought would help, but it didn't. They said, well, the doctor told him that if he takes one more drink, he'll die. That was deep. And... Lo and behold, he took that one more drink and he passed away. But yet, you know, I was at a crossroads in trying to know that I had to get away to make my career, but also it was at the expense of his life. I truly believe. And so for me, I've lost a lot. I've separated from a lot of friends, but that is the one friendship that I wish that I could have done differently. I have a relationship with his daughter. I've gotten to know her. She played in the WNBA for a couple of years. And she called me one day and she said, Eddie, tell me about my dad, because she never knew him. And that was one of the hardest things for me because I had to tell her. I told her everything. I literally told her everything. And she said to me, she said, that's what I wanted to hear.